What is going on everyone? This is Miles Dompierre and welcome to the 112th episode of Xbox Chatter Days. Today I am stoked, I am blessed to be joined back to back by the legend, the Samuel Tolbert doubleheader on Xbox Chatter Days. Sam, how you doing on this fine Saturday, my dude? Uh, I'm glad one of us is blessed, Miles. I'm glad one of us is blessed. <laughs> no, Chad, you gotta understand, I think I'm gonna have a relaxing weekend, right? I think all this nonsense in the news has been sorted. I actually get to go rest up. I can, you know, no, just handle no, anything no, Sam, I need. You I fool! can play a few, you I can fool! play some games. Uh-uh. No, he just hits me up out of the blue in the evening. Hey, Sam, you wanna come on Chatterdays tomorrow? It's like, all right, yeah, sure. All right, <laughs> I'll do it. I'll do it for you, bro. I'll be honest. I'll be honest with that. You and everyone here, I was 90% sure I wasn't doing an episode this week. Uh, you know, I, I touched on everything else going on, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I have the gas in the tank to do it this week. Um, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> then there were some things that, you know, unfortunately in the world of Xbox just can't be ignored. Not a good week to skip. So I'm here in the hot seat with my dude. And since you were on last week talking about all of the uncertainty surrounding the Activision Blizzard acquisition, I thought, you know what? Let's let's do it again. Let's go right back in that pile because today we're going to be talking about a big win for Xbox in this saga, the ABK saga, a huge win for Xbox. What these developments mean for the, the Activision Blizzard acquisition. We're going to be diving into the ID at Xbox Indie Showcase. We're going to be talking about diving into the Limited Run Game Showcase. We're going to be talking about Exo Primal. We're going to be pitching our dream ABK games and so much more. We have a lot to discuss today, and I'm excited to get into all of that. But first, Sam, I know you, again, we always joke about how you have crushed the guest record. You mm -hmm. have been on Xbox Chatterdays more times than anyone by a mile. Um, but for those maybe tuning in for the first time, give us a quick breakdown of who you are and where folks can find you. Yeah, so freelance gaming journalist. I joined Windows Central professionally back in July 2019. So actually just recently celebrated over four years working there. So woohoo, great, great stuff. Uh, Miles and I joined around the same time. So it's been cool to watch him grow, him get to watch me grow. We've been alongside each other. We through thick and thin, sometimes more thin than thick, but hey, that's how it rolls. That's how it Honey, rolls, I'm right? always thick. You feel me? Or <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, but it, it's good. And I'll, so, yeah, you can find my work on Windows Central and Inverse and stuff like that. Yeah, you do amazing work. We always have a good time. And that's why I continue to ask you to come back because you and I can get into any conversation, whether it's good, whether it's bad, and we can have some fun with it. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Huge shout out to everyone in the chat right now watching live. If you are digging the show, hit that like button, share it out. I see amazing folks in the chat like Yo Donnie. We got Huffy Bear CH. We got Miser. We got Drogodus. A lot of returning folks, and I'm excited to share in this episode with everyone today. Some quick housekeeping before we get into the show proper. If you haven't already, consider joining the Xbox Chatterdays Discord. There's a little link in the description if you're interested. Um, Subscribe if you are new. Uh, obviously, you know, I don't want to be the YouTuber says, yo, smash that like button, subscribe, ring the bell. Um, but also, if you could do all of those things, that would be that would be swell for me. And audio listeners, I know there's a decent amount of audio listeners out there. If you are hitting the show, again, I'm going to ask you to feed the algorithm as well. I'm going to ask you to leave a review of the show. Good, bad, hopefully good. Five stars, all right? Treat me like an Uber driver and give me five stars at a pity, okay? just so the overlords don't crash down <laughs> on me and revoke my driving license. <laughs> Some member shout outs, huge, huge shout out and huge appreciation to the folks who are dropping down, dropping money every month to support this channel, support the show. In the supporter tier, we have William Riggs, Huffy Bear CH, Sinful Sadie TTV, Goldshell WPR, Christopher Davis, Buddy McClure, Rachel, Derek Griffin Jones, V Simco, Anthony, Disciple of John Carpenter, and last, but certainly not least, my mom. In the loyalist here, we have John Grasula, Patrick, Nick W, and Assassin. And extra special shout out to the show's producers, Matt Valdez, Yodani Quisada, and Hargi Chani. All right, again, a recurring segment I've been doing lately just because it's fun and I just, I like it. I like talking about video games. That's why I started a video game podcast. So, I want to know what games Samuel Tolbert has been loving this past week. I know there's been a lot going on in the news. I know you've been traveling for some work stuff. Have you yeah. managed to squeeze in any gaming this week? 
I, I did manage to, uh, no thanks to you, but I was able <laughs> to get some yes. done this weekend so far. Uh, but it, it's just a continuation of what I mentioned last week. I'm trying to wrap up Tears of the Kingdom, and I'm trying to wrap up Final Fantasy XVI. Uh, both of those are like, I'm really, really close on both of those to just get into the end. So I've kind of put Diablo 4 to the side for now to, because I'm no, just, I'm nowhere near level 100. So I'm like, hang on, I'm going to get back to you, sweetie. Just let me, let me take these two off the board. Then I can get back to doing that. So, uh, but yeah, just continuing to have fun with those. I've accepted, um, and you can call me a fraud. You can call me a phony, call me what you will. I don't think I'm ever going to beat Tears of the Kingdom, all right? Um, fake gamer. <laughs> fake gamer alert. Woo, woo, woo. Yes, I've uh, I put, I think, 50 plus hours into Tears of the Kingdom. I've done one <laughs> of the four big temples. Um, so it's it's a lost hope for me. It's the same thing with Breath of the Wild. I put in like 60, 70 hours into Breath of the Wild. Didn't beat it because I realized, you know, I just get, in those games, I just get caught up in the world. I get caught up exploring. I say, ooh, what's this shiny thing over here? Ooh, what's this shiny thing over here? And then I spend 70 hours doing that. And then I check in with my friends who beat the game and I'm like, okay, where am I at? And they're like, bro, you're like 20% of the way through. And I go, ah, ooh. <laughs> and so, yes, um, I still have been playing Tears of the Kingdom intermittently. Um, I still love it. It's still an absolutely incredible game. Um, but the game that I've been loving recently, and it's a game, it's not a new game, but it's a game I've gone back to in, in recent weeks. And that's Grounded from Obsidian Entertainment, the li little big game where he plays kids. Honey, I shrunk the kids in the backyard. Um, my wife and I have been playing that for a long time. We both have hundreds of hours. Again, similar to maybe Tears of the Kingdom, Breath of the Wild. You can beat Grounded relatively quickly if you mainline the story, but we have hundreds of hours in and we haven't beaten it. But we're, we're on the cusp. We've triggered the final sequence now. So now we're going through and we're fi you know finding everything we can, trying to get all the secrets, trying to get all the upgrades before we wrap the game and and do essentially everything that's there and that's going to be a sad moment because we've been playing this game for so long and so many hours and that's my wife isn't a huge gamer by any means um funny enough she really only loves pretty extreme survival games she loves state of the k2 has over a thousand hours in state of the k2 and grounded which grounded i play and we're playing on normal difficulty and there's boss fights where i'm like man this is this is rough. This is brutal. Oh. There are some, if you've played Grounded, you know there are some mm -hmm. fights that are just an absolute gauntlet. So, um, yeah, she, she doesn't call herself a gamer. She doesn't play a lot of video games, but funny enough, she just loves the most extreme video games that we can find. So, <laughs> been loving that. Grounded is amazing, and I'm going to be really sad. Again, I haven't really seen how the, it ends. It's been out for a mm -hmm. long time, but I've avoided spoilers this far. Haven't seen how the story concluded, but I will say overall for a survival game, it has one of the most interesting and cohesive narratives because mostly oh, yeah. I've, I've played stuff like Ark and it is just a loop. There is a vague storytelling component, but Grounded has a definitive campaign that you can start and finish. And it's, it's good. It's really good. And it makes me really excited for that Grounded animated series they're doing because the story and the world is, is very interesting. They did again. Oh, yeah. It's Obsidian, so that's kind of what we expect. But sure, man. but no, nonetheless, I do think Miles. There were a lot of questions when they first announced Grounded. What was it? XO nineteen? I think. I think XO nineteen. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it was. Yeah, yeah. It definitely was. Because that was the last XO that happened. Um, and <clears throat> they announced, that and they, there were some questions like a, a survival game, Obsidian, but like what? It still Say feels what? like an Obsidian game, even though it's so different from what they've done before. Kind of like Pentiment in a lot of ways it joins sea of thieves in my you know list of some of the my most favorite recent new ip in gaming in general mm -hmm. from anyone yeah. like it is such a great world it's a, an ingenious concept that when i look at grounded i say how hasn't this been a game already why wasn't this idea tapped into so long ago because you know it's obvious to people who grew up in the 90s 2000s that honey i shrunk the kids world and and that concept but the way that they brought it to life and grounded and with such a small team, it's just a huge achievement. And um, I'm excited to see where that IP goes. I imagine they'll continue to support mainline grounded as even though they released 1.0, they've released huge updates like a wasp and the wasp queen and all these new mechanics and features. So they'll keep updating it. But I wonder if we're going to get a grounded two 
like a full up Grounded 2 or what the future of that franchise is. Because if they're doing an animated series, I can't imagine it's just, oh, we did Grounded once and we're moving on. We're never coming yeah, no, back to Grounded. I, I agree. I, I wholeheartedly agree. But also, Miles, correct me. Someone correct me if you feel differently. As much as I think they have done an amazing job with these updates, and I think they've expanded it really well and it's been cool, I do think there is a finite limit on how yes. much can theoretically be added. This is not Sea of Thieves. Where, sea of Thieves is going to go on for eternity. As long as as long as Sea of Thieves is popular, Rare and their support teams can continue adding to it. I do think there's a cap potentially on what can be added to Grounded. And I, do, I think a sequel would make sense for Grounded. I'm not saying it happens anytime soon. I think it would be like after the animated series and the animated series isn't close. But I, th I think it'll happen. Eventually. Yeah, I agree. Because they have the confines of the yard. Right now we are right. theoretically confined to the yard unless they do wild updates where oh now you're on the other side because you see glimpses of like gas stations and other buildings on the other side we of the could fence. go to the front yard we could go the one yeah. i know a lot of people talk about and the one i would like is if we could go in the house yeah that would be interesting because that would really change how traversal works it would change how construction works because you wouldn't have all the grass and stuff to build with so it, it could be interesting mm. there are things they can do i'm not saying there aren't yes but. so grounded love it obsidian yep. rules obsidian is one of the best in the game top, top right tier. now top, top tier. tier um a huge get one of the biggest gets for xbox just mm -hmm. generally that that team delivers and they deliver consistently and they deliver quickly few developers right now are able to ideate and execute a game in a few years we hear time and time again games take five six seven eight years that's not obsidian's mo and uh, some people look at stuff like The Outer World and say, oh, well, it's not 100 hours. And I say, keep them coming. Give me more 20 to 30 Good. just banger RPGs, and I'm here for it. I'll play every single one of them. Avowed, I am looking forward to you next year. Can't, cannot wait. Let's go, buddy. All right. One thing I do want to touch on that's kind of a bummer, and it was kind of something I wasn't expecting to see this week. But yesterday, Larry Herb, or Major Nelson of Xbox, mm -hmm. announced that he was packing it up. After 20 years of being with Xbox, he took to social media to say his farewell to Xbox and say that he's moving on to the next chapter of his career and he's taking some time to, to time away to spend with his family. And people like me who grew up mm -hmm. with the original Xbox, for as long as I can remember, Larry has been a face and a passionate voice for the Xbox community. You always would see him at fan fests. You would see him at events, taking pictures with fans and really connecting with the community. And he was in a lot of ways, the catalyst and influence for Nintendo and PlayStation to have that sort of personality and that, that liaison to the community in that way. And, and Larry's just been that for so long. And so it's kind of a bummer to see him yeah. pack it up. So I'll turn it over to you if you have any thoughts or memories that you want to share. But just overall for me, I just want to wish him all the best. And, you know, some people might have theories about why or what's going on. But ultimately, when you put in 20 years, I think you deserve a chance to do what you want. And I hope I he's going to do exactly what he wants. And, and you know, chillax. The man's yeah. put, it, put in some time, all right? Yeah, I mean, Miles, I mean, how many times do we hear in this industry about people leaving somewhere after three or four or five years? That's n that's normal. That's considered yeah. normal to like put in your time somewhere and be like, OK, I'm off to the next thing. I got to do this. So like 20 years, that's a lifer, basically. That, like, yeah. in, in my opinion, over to at over 20 years, even if you do something else after that, you were a lifer. Like uh, the, the impact that Larry has had on Xbox and Xbox's, like you said, personality and image cannot be overstated. He was there. Uh, through the thick and thin, through the through the good times, through the rough times, and he always sort of acted like this. I don't, I don't want to say beacon, but just just this pillar that the Xbox community could be talked to, could be drawn to, to have those lines of communication always staying open. Um, yeah, so I, I just want I wish him the best, wish him the absolute best. I hope he takes a long, long vacation. <laughs> yeah, he deserves it, and you bring up some excellent points about his role in the industry as a whole because for a long time there was this hard corporate divide between brands and the community and it was very much we are a business you buy things from us that's the relationship and again some people have i guess concerns or criticisms about the the parasocial relationships between brands like xbox and the community but it just 
it at least on a surface level, it makes everything feel a bit more human when you have a face, when you have a voice you can point to for Xbox and say, this person represents Xbox. This person is out engaging with the community. This person is excited to interact with fans. I never had a chance to meet Larry, unfortunately. And, you same, know, may, I mean, there's again, he's not passing away. So there's still a time for me to potentially <laughs> meet him. But, you know, I saw so many people sharing these stories about times they interacted with him, the time that they met him, what it was like working with him and to see hundreds and thousands of people just champion this individual. It really shows how important he was to the community and Xbox. So it's it's again, it's an end. It's the end of an era. And it's it's a weird time. It's again, every as we get a little bit older. And something I've been reflecting on recently is, you know, eventually things do end and it's it's weird and confusing when they do. And it'll be really interesting to see, you know, he's talking about the next chapter. What is that? Where does Larry go from here? What does he want to do? And that'll be what I'm most curious to see is, you know, clearly he feels fulfilled with Xbox um, and he's ready for something different. And I'm excited to see what that is, because, again, I've never worked anywhere for 20 years. No, no. Uh, I hope I hope, you know, one day to find somewhere where I can lock in and feel secure and have that development and growth to be there 20 years. But yeah, in my career so far that that hasn't happened. So clearly he enjoyed his time with Xbox. Clearly. Yeah. I mean, what, what's that? Uh, one of my favorite songs from Tears for Fears, right? Nothing ever lasts forever. Uh huh. But hey, so that that makes it all the more special. Exactly. Well, so. Cherish the time you have. All right, everyone. Important. So cheers to Larry. Um, yep. and cheers to the, the next chapter in his, his video game saga, a genuine legend. I don't say that lightly. No, an absolute legend, an absolute legend. Hands down. I'm going to get to a couple super chats here before we move on to the old next topic. We got Nick W who says, finally, the Xbox Activision Blizzard merger is done. Can't wait for their games to come to game pass. Or is it Sam? We're going to, we're going we're, we're gonna... <laughs> to, we're going to talk about it. We're, gonna, we're, we're, gonna, we're diving we're, into it. We're almost there. We're, we're, we're almost going. There. I promise we're going to have a lot to say about that. And <sighs> I can't wait. Uh, Gold Shell says my wife has thousands of hours in Sims 4 and Skyrim. Yeah, Sims 4 and Skyrim, two quintessential time sync games. Games that are easy to get lost in. All right. The next topic of the show involves the, the big Game Pass release for the, the the month and really probably the biggest triple a release of july Am I, unless, unless you count no, pikmin no, 4 no, of july of july yeah. of july yeah. yes july specifically unless you're not counting june. Pick, <laughs> not june not june no not august or september but yeah. of july and that is the new ip from capcom called exo primal and if you haven't been following it if you're watching live we have video of of the gameplay but essentially the pitch of this is 5v5 PvPVE, so you have PvE objectives that you're racing against another team to complete, and your main goal is to kill thousands of dinosaurs. Raptors, T-Rexes, Triceratops, you're just getting hit with swarms, and you're racing to do this as fast as possible. When it was revealed, they did a mean-spirited little tease, and they had a character in the game who looked exactly like the lead from Dino Crisis. Red, red hair, hair like red the, hair the and all tight suit and everything. It's like, come on. So the, the reveal trailer started with her and everyone's like, oh, my God. They're and then they cut to what the game is. And everyone says, mm, I don't know. That's not that's not Dino Crisis. But that, sorry, John Muncher. Sorry about that. <laughs> but that being said, I was interested as someone who grew up early 2000s era of gaming. I love games like Earth Defense Force and I love mm. games like Dynasty Warriors. And it's taking that that fundamental idea of just getting together and killing lots of things and throwing in some Overwatch type mechanics. You have progression, you have skills, you have all of these things that tie into the modern landscape. There's a battle pass, there's seasonal progression, there's seasonal challenges, seasonal events. But it's out in the wild. There's been some betas and the play tests overall, I think we're pretty positive. I talked to a lot of people during the play test and I walked away from the play tests pretty positive. The overall gameplay loop is it's flashy. It's fun. Um, it's it's really over the top to be a giant mech with a katana killing a, a triceratops. That is that's just good old fashioned fun to me. But there were a lot of questions about, OK, what's going to be there at launch? They've uh, ahead of the release. They were aggressively talking about their plans for seasons. 
Mm-hmm. They, they teased the Street Fighter collaboration that's going to bring in Mecha Ryu and Mecha Guile. They teased a Monster Hunter crossover. They teased new character skins. So they laid out a, a big roadmap for what's to come. And I think that made a lot of people say, okay, well, it's there at launch. And now that the game is out officially, um, that has really kind of amplified those questions. So we talked a little bit before the show, and I know you haven't had a chance to really dive into this, but where are you at based on what we've seen so far of Exoprimal? I think with Exoprimal, and I don't mean this in a mean way or the wrong way or like downplaying or whatever, I think launching this in Game Pass was a very, very good idea. I think not borrowing this behind a $50, $60 price tag. If they had done that, I don't think it would have had much of a future. I I just can't see that many people taking the risk to jump in, even if they would end up having fun. I think a lot of people would just be put off. But now with Game Pass, it's like, okay, sure, I'm not buying the game. I, I can get in there. Maybe I'll buy the Battle Pass or something if I end up having fun. I think that was probably the right call. And I am eager to go hands on with it myself after we're done here. So, yeah, it's one of those things where, again, I. This gets weaponized or this is kind of a dirty conversation when we talk sure, about sure. a good Game Pass game, quote unquote. And mm-hmm. there's been the again, this comes from people with disingenuous takes, mostly from people who are just interested in downplaying the entire system. But there are people who talk about Game Pass filler and how certain types of games don't exist, can't can't exist in Game Pass. And so Capcom this year has had Resident Evil 4 and Street Fighter 6, which are two of the best reviewed games of the year. Uh, Both on my top 10, guaranteed. Both games are incredible. Both games are two of my favorite games this year by far. I'm still playing Street Fighter 6 every single day. I beat Resident Evil 4 four times. As soon as the the Ada Wong DLC drops, I'm, I'm there. I'm back again, baby. No questions. Let's do it. Love it. But then people are saying, okay, well, why, why isn't Resident Evil 4 in Game Pass? And why isn't Street Fighter 6 in Game Pass? And there are, you know, when we look at Game Pass, I think there are some fair, fair implications that not every single game should or can be in Game Pass. Mm-hmm. Because it really needs to be a mutually beneficial relationship for Xbox and the publisher. And mm-hmm. if the publisher is confident the game is going to sell gangbusters, like... Resident Evil 4, for example, they would go to Xbox and say, oh, you want it in Game Pass? Okay, here's a stupid number. We know we're going to sell 10 million plus copies, so your Game Pass deal needs to be closer Mm -hmm. to that amount. And Xbox says, I don't think we're going to make that much money if we put that in Xbox Game Pass. So we're going to we're going to we're going to pass on that. But Exoprimal, that looks cool. How are you feeling about Exoprimal? Capcom has done a lot of events and showcases leading up to the release of Exoprimal, which makes me feel like. They're trying to convince people that this new IP is a hit. They're trying to get people Mm -hmm. in the door with this new IP. And there's no better vessel for that than Game Pass. It it breaks down that that $60 barrier to entry. Because again, I think it's a lot of people were on the fence about spending $60 on this game. And so you have a system like Game Pass that lets people get in the door. It's a multiplayer focused game. People can try it. If they love it, they can invest in the battle pass. They can invest in the seasonal content. And if not, they can move on and play something else. And it's not a big burden or loss to the to the player. So again, I don't say this as a dig on Game Pass or a dig on the game, but I do agree that this is an excellent Game Pass get. And I, with the timing of it being a summer release with its multiplayer focused elements, I always figured it would be a good quote Game Pass release. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I do want to talk about my impressions of it because I'm about six hours in. I played two of the three betas ahead of launch. So I spent a decent amount of time with Exoprimal going into it. So I knew exactly what this game was going to be. Two questions I had from the beta going into it is how much content is going to be there? We saw a small portfolio of maps. We saw a small portfolio of modes during the betas. And there were 10 exosuits. Um, So that was my big question going into the full launch is what is the meat of this game at launch? And there's been a lot of people who have, you know, played the game a few rounds and bounced off and said, this is the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I understand that. I I really do because the onboarding experience is really slow. There's a slow introduction. There's a tutorial tutorial you have to do. Then there is this overarching campaign, 
not a campaign mode, but there is a story with cutscenes that play in between the game mode. So the progression for that, if you're unfamiliar, you play the main mode, which is the 5v5 Dino Survival, and you unlock cutscenes. And those cutscenes tell the story. Then there's this separate page that's an entire lore tree with voiceovers and, and pictures and, and graphics that really expand the lore. So if you are interested in the lore of this game, there is a surprising amount to it. But the overall gameplay is the 5v5 round-based, objective-based multiplayer modes. You go to one point, you kill dinosaurs. You go to another point, you kill dinosaurs. You go to another point, and then you move the payload. And then there's some PvP elements kind of sprinkled in throughout that as well. One thing the game does not tell you at all in any way is that every 10 rounds, you unlock new events, you unlock new modes, and you unlock new dinosaurs. That feels important to mention. But, so, okay. literally, when you play the first 10 rounds, it is the same thing over and over and over. And you're like, this is it? This is the launch game? Like, there is nothing here. And then we were playing last night, and we got to 10 rounds. And then new dinosaurs appeared. New events we appeared that we had never seen. New maps had appeared that we had never seen before. And then we got to 20 rounds in. And then entirely new boss dinosaurs show up. And you're like, what? Why, why isn't this conveyed to the player that this is how the progression works yeah because, yeah because a lot of people aren't going to stick around for that they're just going to assume that what they played for 10 rounds granted let me 10 rounds that's a couple hours you can't do 10 mm -hmm. rounds that quickly 10 rounds is a several hour investment in the game and that's when things start to unlock so that is a big you know that's just a psa if you are playing and mm -hmm. you like the core gameplay but you think it's repetitive Unfortunately, it's everything is gated to 10 levels, it seems like. So every 10 That's rounds. That's a weird decision. That's a yeah. really weird decision. Because right. they tell you that by completing these game modes, that's how you unlock the cutscenes. But what they don't tell you is that that's also how you unlock new dinosaurs. So I haven't even seen, I'm, I think, seven, yes, about seven hours in, and I haven't even seen the T-Rex yet. I just unlocked the, the Diphlosaurus, the little, little tiny guys from Jurassic Park. Tiny ones from the opening sequence of Jurassic oh, Park 2. Oh. You mean Look. compies, uh, comes to Magnus. Oh yeah, yeah. And um, so th those are there and those are cool. It's a huge swarm and they climb all over your mechs. And so th moments like that happen and, and it kind of reinvigorates my interest because mm -hmm. I love the core gameplay of this. It's, it's really fast. It focuses on speed overall. So it's just, you're doing things as fast as you can, killing things as fast as you can and you're racing. So there's this incentive to just go, 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 go. And I love that loop. I love fighting the dinosaurs. I think the mech powers, while they are derivative of Overwatch, there's there's a Winston archetype, there's a Junkrat archetype, there's a Mercy archetype. They are very derivative of Overwatch. You know, not blatantly, but it's obvious where they're, where they're pulling inspiration for some of these exosuits. That being said, every exosuit feels really great. And I've had a lot of time, a lot of fun experimenting with the 10 exosuits. Um, it's kind of grindy in the sense that if you don't have the deluxe edition, um, mm -hmm. Some of the characters are gated to like player level 40, which I'm again, I'm seven hours in and I'm player level 13. So it's going to take me a oh, long, okay. long ass time to get. But again, I, I will say I was provided a code for the game. So I have the deluxe edition. So I'll just say that up front. So I have sure. all the characters. But then I was talking to people who didn't. And they're like, oh, I don't have the sniper. And I'm like, oh, that's weird. What do you need to get the sniper? And they're like, I need to be level 40. And I was like, oh, my God smother of god that's a grind so there are concerns about the grind and i do have questions about the long-term tale of this game we know two weeks from now they're adding the kind of extreme mode which is designed for if you have high level suits high level gear take that on with a dedicated squad they're going to be adding more events and monsters and maps with with the seasonal content but i do wonder what the community is going to look like in the next couple weeks as mm -hmm. People have seen everything the game has to offer. And I've seen people, you know, come out on Twitter already and say, I'm done. I don't I don't like this. It's really repetitive. And again, I will say that that is partly true. The overall loop can be repetitive, but it's also the fact that they don't do a very good job onboarding new players in this game. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Exo Primal. Would I personally recommend someone spend $60 on it? No, no. I can't, as it currently stands, again, I'm, this isn't a formal review. I'm going to come back after a few more play sessions and see where I'm at, but I would, I can't recommend someone spend $60 on it unless you absolutely adored 
what the loop was in the beta unless you've played it because um it is it's a very distinct game in terms of the way it plays and in, in in the way it feels and i love the way it feels i really love the way the exoprimal feels um but again this is a a great game pass get in the sense that you can try it and see if it's for yeah, you yeah. and not feel because i could see people who spent 60 dollars feeling kind of bad about it playing it for five hours and saying this isn't what i want and again as soon as they started messaging the the seasonal strategy which is standard in this day and age it made me feel like the launch offering was going to be fairly light and again considering things unlock every 10 rounds i don't know the full scope of the game yet sure. but for yeah. the first seven hours it's it's definitely i can see the complaints about it being repetitive for sure and so yeah that, that's that's where we're at with exoprimal um it is a it's not going to be a an unquestionable 9 out of 10 or 10 out of 10 like Resident Evil 4 and Street Fighter 6 for a lot of people. But if you enjoy Earth Defense Force, if you enjoy Overwatch and you have a squad that wants to get down and, and just speed run every single round, that just chaotic, frantic energy. It's one of those games that gets me standing up a little bit, you know, you know, when you're really into a game and you have to kind of stand up a little bit because there's just oh, yeah, so much yeah. happening and so much going on. I'm getting that. And for me, that's the sign of a fun game. And it's not a game that I need to grind every single day, and it's not a game I probably will grind every single day. But that being said, what is presented here is fun. It's a it's a cool concept. It's a fun game, and I hope that the there is an audience that remains engaged, so we can see more content come to the game. Right. All right, I want to give a huge shout out to all the amazing people joining us live for Xbox Chatterdays. If you are digging the show, hit that like button, share it out, and. Let's dive into the ID at Xbox showcase. Because, um, you know, we just came off the back of June of showcase season. Mm -hmm. We had PlayStation, we had Xbox, we had Ubisoft, we had Capcom. Everyone and their mother had a showcase. And we thought we were done. We thought, okay, we're done. That's it. We're on the other side. But no, this week we got the ID at Xbox showcase and the limited run game showcase as well with, with more new reveals, more new announcements. And so if you're unaware, IGN partnered with ID at Xbox to host their annual showcase. And it featured over 20 games, some new reveals, some Game Pass announcements, and just some quick updates for stuff we already knew about. So... A lot of it, again, was stuff we already knew about. So I want to know, as we look at the future of, of Xbox in the coming year-ish, what are the indie games Sam Tolbert has his eyes on? What's standing out to you right now? I mean, so I'll tell you right now, the standout to me from that showcase, from the IGN, you know, well, partnered with IGN ID at Xbox showcase, is the Hellboy game. I absolutely love the style of that emulating the graphic novels and then, you know, uh, the fact that it's going to be one of Lance Reddick's final roles yeah you know, posthumously that that's a that's a little bittersweet of course because it's going to be a little rough hearing that but also what a perfect casting choice for hellboy like c come on uh so yeah I, I i have a couple of questions about exactly how it's still going to work but i was in at the reveal and seeing it here at this showcase i was like yes that is that is what i want from an indie style hellboy game Yes, that game continues to look great. Very heavily cell shaded art style. It looks like a comic book. Again, you have Lance Reddick as the voice of Hellboy, which is awesome. Again, like you said, also a bummer. It's going to be sad to see these projects that he worked on before he passed kind of come out as the last testaments to, to his legacy. But yeah. that game, that game looks great. For me, there were a couple of standouts. Uh, Stray Souls being one, which is mm -hmm. from a an independent developer that's Again, pulling a lot of inspiration from Silent Hill. They even have Akira, the, the famed composer of Silent Hill. They announced that he was going to be doing some music for this project. They showed off some gameplay, and it is pulling a lot of inspiration from classic survival horror. And as a longtime survival horror fan, that looks right up my alley. So that was a great moment, um, and that was a great announcement. Akira also worked on the medium. Akira is you know, just has a legacy for delivering atmospheric horror music. And so it's it's awesome to see him lending his talents to smaller teams with these games and trying to, you know, use that star power to, to elevate some smaller projects. So that is awesome. Sea of Stars continues to look so, yeah. so, so good. That so was my good. number two as well. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't new. Great. We didn't really get anything new for the most part. We got a new trailer. Sure. But... 
every time I look at that game, I just I just get more and more excited to play it. And if you're unfamiliar with Sea of Stars, it is a throwback to SNES era RPGs. Chrono Trigger is a heavy inspiration. There are sequences that are paying tribute to games like Secret of Mana as well. They are pulling inspiration from a very specific era of RPGs. And the pixel art is gorgeous. They, mm-hmm. they also have some star power with the composer, who I, I'm blanking on the name, but the composer of Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, Xenoblade Chronicles 3. So there's some weight to that as well, and fans of that genre are really eyeballing this. Another big Xbox Game Pass drop. It's dropping in September, day one in Xbox Game Pass. Another big Xbox Game Pass drop that I'm excited about is the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh, okay. Yeah, so where are you at with that, Sam? I know I'm a big horror nerd. Where are you at? I'm a little... There's been more misses than hits with these types of games. Just unfortunate. I think think a lot of them... When they now some of them got better over time. Some of them, like Friday the Thirteenth, there were situations outside of the developer's control that they couldn't really like. They literally weren't allowed to update. So I understand. I, I have a bit of grace for that. I, I, we'll see how well this turns out. We, we'll see. Yes, I have played it. I played it last October, and that was mm-hmm. a very early version of the game. I like the loop. If you've played Friday the Thirteenth, it is very much that, but amplified because you have three killers now and four survivors so you start as a survivor you're essentially meat hooked in a basement and you need to get out of these locations there's a lot of different ways you can escape but much like friday the 13th that is your overall objective is figuring out a way to escape and you have leatherface you have the cook you have i think the bandit and one other there might be Mm -hmm. more there's a there's a more than three killers but essentially they are trying to stop you from escaping and everyone has their pros and cons leatherface will kill you instantly because he has a chainsaw but he's super slow he can't crawl so you can crawl through a little cubby and he can't get you but then the bandit type class he can crawl he can sprint he can do almost everything that the humans can do so you can't really escape from him in the same ways so there's a really interesting dynamic i'm really Really interested to see how that plays out because my biggest problem with those asymmetrical games outside of the inherent problem with balance is there's always been one killer and X number of survivors, which Mm -hmm. means if you ever wanted to be the killer, you couldn't play with your friends really. So we, you know, those games, my friend group, we would never, ever be the killer. And it would always get to the point after a few months where no one wanted to be the killer because everyone was playing with their friends. And so the matchmaking was disjointed because of that. But now that we can have a balance of matchmaking as the killer with our friends, I'm hoping that that kind of fixes that inherent problem that happens with every single asymmetrical horror game where somebody just doesn't want to be the killer (laughs) because they don't want to play by themselves. That is just a hurdle. And I think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre by doing 3v4 is inherently addressing that. So I'm excited. It is, it's not very action-y in terms of the combat. When you're a survivor, you don't really have a lot of options to fight back. So I know people don't like that. Um, That's going to be a problem. But again, another Game Pass drop. And I, again, another game that I think is going to get a huge boost from being in Game Pass. Mm -hmm. Crossplay as well at launch, which um, if you're going to launch an asymmetrical horror game in this day and age, you you, you have to. I'm sorry. Don't even bother releasing it if there's no crossplay. And again, I think everyone realizes that, that you need as many people possible playing the game. You cannot segment the community. So, yeah, a lot of great indie stuff coming to Xbox, a lot of great stuff at that showcase. If you haven't checked it out, it's about an hour uh, we also have a breakdown over on Windows Central of everything that was revealed. Yeah, want. just a, a quick breakdown with the trailers. All right. Another showcase that was surprised, surprisingly good, and I stress that so much, was the limited run games, the LRG3. Limited run games saves E3 showcase this year. Pulling some inspiration from Devolver Digital. Definitely. And, and having a Definitely. weird, campy presentation, purposely really saturated VHS style recording. And they went through and announced everything that they were working on. Uh, several weeks ago, actually a few months ago at this point, I had Modern Mint- Vintage Gamer on. And he is a big part of the future of limited run games because of the Carbon Engine. And he is a big advocate for video game preservation. And that has kind of been the mantra and the the mission statement of 
companies like Digital Eclipse and Limited Run Games. So this show, if you're someone who has been playing games for a while, playing stuff on the SNES and PS1 era in particular, oh man, oh damn this show hit. It's, <laughs> it, I had no expectations going into it. I wasn't sure at all what it was going to be there, but this show just had hit after hit. Some big standouts, Clock Tower, the, mm -hmm. the, the SNES horror classic. It's, it's a cult hit. It was released in Japan, never really officially released in the West. There were fan translations, but officially the game has never existed in English. It is a pixel-based point-and-click RPG that launched on the Super Famicom way back in 1995 and has sort of been lost to time. Capcom has done future iterations on other consoles. PS2, there were several uh, Clock Tower games as well. I want to say there's one on PS1 that wasn't the Japanese-only re-release of the original Clock Tower, but a, a, a historic game that directly influenced Resident Evil and directly influenced Silent Hill as well. This is a very transformative game in the genre. It's coming to Xbox, it's coming to PlayStation, it's coming to Switch, it's coming to PC, and it's going to be in English for the first time ever. So that was, again, for horror nerds, people who like going down those rabbit holes, mm -hmm. that, was, that was a huge moment. Sam, any highlights from you from this show? Definitely. Um, the, the Jurassic Park games collection. Definitely. Yes. I, some, of those, some of those games, Miles, I was like, I thought this was lost to time. I thought this was just never going to see the light of day again. I would never have guessed in, in 100 years that like some of those games are going to be coming back. I didn't even know about a couple of them. It's, it's a very neat collection. Sure, I'm sure some of them have not aged all that well. I don't care. I played a lot of them when I was a kid. I have a lot of nostalgia for those older games. So I'm like, yeah, just, just bring it on. This is good. Nostalgia this is a really hell good. of a drug, all right? And yeah. limited run games just injecting it straight into my veins because whew, th this one got me. This one, as much as I was stoked for Clock Tower, this is the one that rocked my world because I thought for sure this game was never ever coming back had no chance no shred of hope to ever see the light of day again and if you follow me on social media you've probably seen me post a picture of a a caveman with pink hair like what the what the hell is this what on earth is this game from and limited run games announced that tomba for ps1 is coming to modern consoles thanks to the carbon engine baby modern vintage gamer you absolute goat you're, you're, you are <laughs> goaded for this. I, you need to know that because, my God, that was the moment that had me standing up and screaming in my seat because that is such an obscure game. That's a game I talk about so often and have so many people, even people that are my age that played PS1 games say, what? I'm sorry, yeah, what, what is this? About? <laughs> Tomba? What on earth? And then I try to explain. It's like, oh, it's a it's a game where you're a caveman. You wear green shorts. You have pink hair. There's these like pig baddies. You jump on them. You do a front flip and smash them into the ground. And everyone's just completely unaware that this game <laughs> exists. And it's coming to everything except for Xbox. And so Oof. if you have a PC, if you have a PlayStation and you have a Switch, you'll be able to play it. But if you have an Xbox... I don't, I don't know what the situation is. I did reach out to MVG and say, yo, dog, can you give me some insights here? Yeah. Is there any hope? Should I give up all hope of it coming to Xbox? So if I get an official update there, I will let you all know. Um, but yeah, the show, again, for, for, nostal for nostalgia's sake, it had Gex. It had the Jurassic Park collection. It had Tomba. Um, I, yeah, that ended up being one of my favorite shows of the season i was again went into it with little expectations and they mm -hmm. crushed it man oh that was a good show so on this topic one thing i want to have some fun with you and the chat here when we look at you know now that tomba's here anything's possible anything is on the table at this point when they're when they're getting cuts that deep so when we look at the past games that have not been ported or are not currently playable on modern hardware which I saw a recent study that suggested that I think roughly 87% of games that have released throughout time have not are not playable on current hardware. So there's mm -hmm. there's a lot to choose from. What's the Samuel Tolbert holy trinity holy trinity of retro games that need ports on modern hardware? 
So the asterisk mark here is that some of these games are playable due to Xbox's backward compatibility program, but they have not technically been ported and they could stand to be ported okay. all the same to revitalize them. So that a bit of an asterisk mark there. But first one, it's the GOAT. It's the original Star Wars Battlefront 2. Legendary, oh. undefeated, und oh. just still the reigning champ. With, on with modern online, right? With modern online. Oh, That's the thing. The Xbox yeah. backward compatibility, oh. otherwise, it's got you covered. The, the visuals, the frame rate is great. Playing, playing that on Series X, whenever I meet up with my brothers, we get together and we play that split screen on the Series X. It's fantastic. I just wish I could do online. Can you imagine 16 player or expanded 32 player Battlefront 2 online? Like, oh, I can imagine. I've been imagining that for so long. So yeah. I'm with you. 100. Yes, I back that with every fiber of my being. Let's go, dude. I, I just that game. I, I genuinely think I've put more time into that game than any other game on Earth. G literally thousands, plural of hours thousands upon thousands spent playing as a kid and even today maybe not as much today but like even now you know boot up play with my brothers it's it's what a, what a legendary game what a phenomenal oh game. that that is a game that i remember playing so much on original xbox me my younger sister my younger brother we loved it we played it so much and we had a a family trip to our grandparents house a while back and we packed up the xbox we brought the xbox we brought controllers and we thought we thought we brought star wars battlefront 2 and unfortunately when we got there we realized we did not pack the game we wanted to play and it was one of those games where we just we rushed to the lo like a local Walmart or Target or whatever it was, and we tracked that down. We we tracked down another copy of Star Wars Battlefront Two on Xbox because that is how much we loved that game. And we weren't we weren't going to go even just the, the couple days we were at my grandparents' house not playing that game. So man, yeah, that's a good shout. That's a good shout right there. Mm -hmm. uh, so the other one I've got the other two. I'm cheating a bit because it's like. They were they were originally separate games and then they kind of combined them into one. So I'll explain. I think you can do some finicky stuff on PC to get it running. It definitely doesn't run out of the box if you were able to find a box or find, you know, the disc or something. But the original Zoo Tycoon and all of its expansions. The, oh. the OG. That's the other one that like I really want because they yeah. had one, it was Zoo Tycoon, but then they released a standalone also was an expansion it was kind of weird where you could do aquariums and then they did one that was it was jurassic park but like the brand name was ripped off right it was dinosaurs and, and other like prehistoric animals i i would love to be able to play that again that's a i'm not a big city builder person city builders have to be really good for me to play them there's exceptions i loved the og zoo tycoon uh fantastic collection i think i still have the box like the box set that came with everything somewhere around here. I might have to track that down. Um, not sure. But yeah, just br bring bring the OG Zoo Tycoon back for me. Please. Yes, man. Sam's coming. Sam's coming prepared with some hits. So you got any others? One more you want to shout out? G give me give me give me a moment on that one. If you've got any that are like burning at the top of your brain. This wasn't on my list, but it should have been. And I want to shout out Nintendo the Otaku. Coming with with an excellent take, saying, "I just wanted Sunset Riders." Hell Ooh. yes, the SNES port, Sunset Riders, a Konami arcade game. The SNES version of Sunset Riders, an all time masterpiece. Contra who? No, Sunset Riders puts Contra to shame. Let me tell you, that is the that is the definitive side scrolling shooting game. It is a western. It's got some of the most iconic bosses of any side scrolling game. Uh, I have you may have seen a shirt I posted. It's a very obscure deep cut where it's just a blonde cowboy guy and it's just text on the shirt that says bury me with my money. And that is a sound <laughs> bite, a sound clip that has been in my head for decades. And it's from the first boss of Sunset Riders. So yes, yeah, Sunset Riders, bring that to modern consoles. Give it online multiplayer right now. Right this second. How it hasn't happened is out of out of this world, out of control. And that is a great shout from Nintendo on the Otaku. Oh, and then awesome. Tando, Tando's coming at you saying, Planet Zoo is 10 times better than Zoo Tycoon. You gonna stand Miss for me. that? Miss you me. You gonna stand Miss for that slander? That. These... 
Oh, Planet Zoo, Planet Who? Come on, <laughs> oh. we're, we're not doing this. We're Planet not doing this. And yeah, yeah. I've, I've got my <laughs> other one. If you if you want one more, um, backward compatibility program did a great job for for Xbox. They they did a phenomenal job getting a lot of those classic OG Xbox titles. Miles, there's one they didn't get that still bugs me. Mm, hit and me. It still, we still got. really bugs me. It was amped freestyle snowboarding. Oh, damn. Amped. That was a, if you had an OG Xbox, that was there. That was in your oh, yeah. library. You guaranteed. End of discussion. Uh, just, and again, I'm not even a sports guy. I'm not really a sports game person. I loved amp snowboarding. Uh, just nah, missed that game. That was, in, really, that really was in the that era game. when everyone was trying to compete with Tony Hawk. So people were bringing it. People were really trying to match yep. that energy, match that intensity. And Amp was a byproduct of that. And Amp ruled. I didn't even, I didn't care about snowboarding at all, but I loved that game. Exactly. That, that's the thing. You didn't have to care about snowboarding. It was just fun to play regardless. Yeah. Good, um, good shouts, man. Hell yeah. Love that. Um, I have three. I have three and I... I kept it to, I think, PS1 era. Yeah, all of these are PS1 era. All of these are PS1 certified masterpieces. Well, two out of three are certified masterpieces. One is just a weird-ass game that I have nostalgia for. First up, Parasite Eve. Parasite Ooh. Eve. Okay. Square Enix has a just a robust catalog of amazing IP. They put out so many amazing games over the years. But one that we see a lot of people talk about and have you know, fond memories of is this weird turn-based RPG that was also also a survival horror game called Parasite Eve. They did a few of them. They did a sequel to Parasite Eve 1, and then there was a PSP game as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so there wasn't, it wasn't a long-running franchise, but it was a franchise that people really love. And you know, that clock towers on the table, Capcom is saying, all right, here's this weird ex IP. We're not doing anything with it. We're not going to touch yeah, yeah. this. So you can have you go. LRG. Yeah, yeah I, I hope that Square Enix looks at LRG, looks at Clock Tower and says, yeah, you know what? Let's do that with Parasite Eve. All right. We don't we don't have the source code. We don't have it. Thanks to the carbon engine, they can go in and they can make that work. So Parasite Eve, let's go. Another one. Brave Fencer Musashi. You ever Ooh. heard of that? You ever heard of that little I, ditty? Oh, it's been a long time. It's been years, plural, since I've heard that name. Oh, oh, I think that was another Squaresoft joint. And my God, what a game. It was a really cool action. I, not really. It had RPG elements, but it was mostly like an action adventure game where you played a little little ninja samurai character. You fought huge over the type over the top bosses. You're, it was kind of chibi in terms of the uh, proportions mm -hmm. of characters. But Brave Fencer Musashi is a game that. Another one that a lot of people don't really talk about that just came out in this period of time where Squaresoft was just dropping game after game after game and everything they dropped was really, really good. The PS1 library was so stacked. There was so much competition and people could put out great games in a matter of 12 to 18 months and they were over and over and over again. So that's another shout. My final shout is Nightmare Creatures, which is originally an Activision published IP. I have no idea who owns it now. I don't think Activision does. They probably sold it for pennies a long time ago, but it was the first Bloodborne, all right? It was the first Bloodborne from software, ripped off nightmare creatures on PS1. <laughs> no, but in all seriousness, it was a weird, gothic, dark, gritty action kind of sort of hack and slash game. It was a little clunky. You fought vampires, you fought werewolves, you fought nightmare creatures they did a sequel and rob zombie did all the music i think to the sequel i don't know if he did the music to the original but it was very very much a late 90s early 2000s ass game um but it's one of those franchises that had a reboot in development a few years ago but then that was quietly canceled and now it doesn't sound like that's happening but i would love just to go back and have the original playable on modern consoles just because again it's for me, I love going back to games that had great ideas, but poor execution and really oh, yeah, looking about sure. how how they potentially influenced other games. And Nightmare Creatures is one of those those games I remember renting three, four different times, never even coming close to beating it because I had no idea what to do, um, but still <laughs> really liking the overall world. So that's my kind of weird trinity of games I'd love to see come back. Thanks to the the old carbon engine, which, again, Floodgates are open. Floodgates are wide open. 
Uh, we got Hussein saying, bring back radical entertainment. Ar oh, Army Men Sarge's Heroes is a good shout from Space Dovahkiin. Oh, that's good. That's that's a good one. That's a good oh, one. Oh, man. This is taking me back. N Nintendon also shouting out Kung Fu Chaos. Oh, man. We're, we're in a little time capsule, right? Ugh. Good games. Good games. All right, Sam. And all right, chat. Are you ready for the meat? The meat and potatoes of this week's episode of Xbox Chatter Days. And that is the, the latest developments surrounding the Activision Blizzard acquisition and this idea that maybe, Sam, may, maybe, just maybe. maybe, once and for all, we're done. We're done. We're done. Are we done? That'll be my first question. Sam, are we done? Nothing is certain in life except uh, taxes, death, and the ABK deal. That being said, Miles, I, we're, we're done. Or we're like, we're really darn close <laughs> to being done. We're like, we are at the 99.9.9, .9, you know, just repeating, repeating on end percent mark. We're, we're there. It's going to go through. But let's yep. talk about why it's going to go through. Exactly. That, it, your mood was a little different last week. You gotta call, gotta put you on the spot. Yeah, I know because again, nothing is official until it's official, and that's my that's current right, no. stance. That's right. That's always my stance. You know, don't count your chickens before they hatch. All the old adages because mm -hmm. shit happens, guys. It yeah. it shit happens, and that costs people billions of dollars every single day. And let's be real, Miles. This saga over the last eighteen, closing in on nineteen months has had more twists and turns than any drama series. Like, it's unrealistic how many at the last minute, oh, well, this is definitely it. And then just, like, Michael Myers or The Undertaker, just, nope, nope, they get right back up. We're, we're going to keep it, doing it's, it. It's been hilarious because I started watching Succession for the first time a few months ago, since so many people uh, were talking about show. it. And that's great show. The, the parallels between Succession and the ABK deal have just been hilarious. I'm watching it way after the fact, getting caught up. And like you said, the twist, the turns. Oh, we have this plan. This is how it's going to go out. The deal's closed. Somebody gets a phone call. Oh my God, the deal's off. And it's just, that's what this saga has been. This saga has been real life succession at its finest. And it's been, you know, while it's been exhausting to cover, it has been interesting because of the implications for the game industry. We've never had a deal this big. No. We've never had stakes this high for Microsoft and other players. There's a lot of other big publishers and platform holders looking at this deal very carefully. Yeah. And that's it will set precedent. Yeah, it will set precedent and that will dictate what the next few years look like in terms of these major acquisitions and what realistically what these companies can get away with. So let's get everyone caught up with what's going on, starting from the very beginning. Microsoft announced that they wanted to buy Acquisition Blizzard for roughly 69 Activision billion. Blizzard, not Acquisition Blizzard. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Acquisition <laughs> on the brain. Activision Blizzard for $69 billion. At that time, that was the biggest video game acquisition ever proposed. We are just coming off the back of Bethesda for $7.5 billion, which at the time was one of the biggest. Second uh, biggest. Second, second biggest. biggest yeah. So, so astronomical leap a 10 times leap in terms of the value of this deal and it came 11th hour of january right after the holidays the word on the street was this deal kind of i don't want to say it fell into their lap but it was a, an opportunity that they felt they couldn't pass down where they could get activision blizzard for very cheap relatively speaking again i can't even In comparison to what they are worth yes i can't fathom 69 billion dollars but relatively <laughs> That was a bargain. That was a uh, steal for a, a trillion dollar company like Microsoft. So over the last 18 months, Mike, the world has been looking at this deal and all of these countries have been saying yay or nay. Is there a problem? Is there not a problem? Will this inherently harm competition? There are regulatory bodies in a lot of major countries that determine whether or not this deal is going to be okay in their country. So a lot of them have been in favor of it. There have really only been two notable standouts, and that is the CMA from the UK and the FTC in the United States. And so those have been the two biggest hurdles. And the, for the longest time, the CMA was the big hurdle. That was the, that was the big vocal critic. And then in recent weeks, we've been dealing with the FTC saying, all right, the deadline for this deal is July 18th. We want more time. 
We want more time to dissect what this deal means. We want more time to figure out how this can hurt com competition, how this will harm competition. So they requested a preliminary injunction hearing. And this hearing was designed to determine whether or not they would get that additional time, whether or not there were immediate harms to competition that, that would occur if Microsoft closed this deal. And if, you know, without that preliminary injunction hearing, Microsoft was set to close this deal. And so we are coming up on the 11th hour at this point. July 18th is early next week. That is next Tuesday. Yep. So we, we had the five-day process. We had the preliminary injunction hearing. There was the drama. There was the quotes. There was the emails. There was so much information about what this deal meant, how this deal could harm the industry. You had a Xbox saying, yo, it's cool. Everything's good. We're nice. We want to bring games to everyone. Then you had the FTC saying, no, they're the big baddies. They are going to you know, corner this market, destroy this market. They're going to be able to completely dictate what this market is because no one can compete with them. We've Ultimate. measured the harms to Sony. All that exactly. Stuff. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Jim Ryan. I've been on the phone with Jim Ryan the last several weeks. He's he's been crying. He's been in tears because he's thinking about the gamers and he's really afraid of what this means for the gamers around the world. Um, so there's yes, there's been a lot of hyperbole. There's been a lot of drama. But ultimately, Judge Corley decided, sorry, FTC, your case was not strong enough. You don't get the preliminary injunction. FTC said, whoa, hold on. Emergency appeal. They played their trap card and said, hold on. No, this, this can't be. This will not stand. We are not allowing this to stand. They, they filed an emergency appeal. And then late yesterday afternoon, that was denied as well. And that, that right there, that would have been the death knell of this deal. Because we've heard Activision Blizzard come out and say, you know, on July 18th, we're walking away. We're walking away. And if they walk away from the deal, they don't have to. That is a misconception I want to address right now is there right. is this it's a choice. There's this July 18th deadline where at that point, either company can walk away and say, nah. But either way, if, if either company decides to do that, that is $3 billion out of Microsoft's pocket. Huge, huge chunk of change for nothing on top of the 18 months of elite mega lawyers, uh, a lot of jet travel, <laughs> a lot of expenses. We can't pretend like this deal has not been expensive just day to day for Microsoft. So that oh, would have yeah. been so much money just, just gone. Again, I can't even fathom $3 billion. Imagine just throwing $3 billion in the trash. You can't, you can't, <laughs> you can't even imagine it. So that would have been gone. So now, Sam, we are at a point where CMA is still the holdout here. So I've been rambling for a bit. Get us caught up on where we currently stand here with this deal so, and whether or not it's going through. So with this, with the uh, the injunctive relief, which is a fancy way for anyone who doesn't understand of saying the FTC wanted the uh, temporary restraining order extended. That's what injunctive relief means. With the injunctive relief denied, the FTC doesn't matter. They're, you're you're going to I'm going to tell you right now you're going to hear a lot about the FTC continuing to try things. They're going to try and get Microsoft in their mm -hmm. internal court in August. You're going to hear about them complaining about different things. They don't matter anymore. They have, the FTC has been defeated. It's very clear at this point that the courts are siding with Microsoft, and Microsoft is just they're going, they're going to continue to win against them. If the I I am I won't even be surprised if the FTC just decides to abandon this pursuit against Microsoft at this point. Yeah. I won't be surprised if they don't, but I won't be surprised if they do, uh, but they don't matter anymore. The CMA is the last problem. They are the last holdout. And there's a lot of misconception. There's a lot of ideas floating around. What we understand is that for months after the CMA made their decision to block the deal based on cloud gaming, they were not talking to Microsoft. They were not in entertaining any new negotiations. Yep. They were like, nope, our opinion stands. They got snappy with the European Commission because, you know, there's that whole drama of Brexit and they used to be part of the EU uh -huh. and now they aren't. So there's there's some drama there as well because you have this, shall we say, more conservative-led government that was promising free business and all that and the UK is open and they denied this big deal whereas the socialist countries of the european union have allowed it and that's kind of an interesting look there are some yes, the political implications with all of that there's there's some not doesn't look great so that's a whole thing 
But now it appears that the CMA is actually entertaining negotiations again. The timing is very amusing. Don't get me wrong. I know some people seem to think it was like they saw what happened to the FTC. They saw the ruling from Judge Corley. Realistically, Microsoft was already talking to them about this a few days before that. Realistically, you know, Sarah Bond, uh, you you caught that sudden vacation she went on to the UK. (laughs) I, I have my suspicions about whether or not that was actually a vacation and all that. Microsoft was clearly talking to the CMA going, okay, look, you see how it's going in the court. We've got a good case. Do you really want that to be you? Do you really want us to go through this? Do you want us to keep fighting again and again and again and again for months? No, you probably want to just get this off your back. And so we're going to offer you something to get it off your back. What can we offer you? Reportedly, Microsoft is willing to give up the rights to ABK games in the cloud in the UK. That means they would sell the cloud rights, not the games, but the cloud rights specifically to a telecom company like EE or something like that, where that company could then say, okay, we hold the rights to these cloud games. The CMA's entire case was built on cloud. They no longer have any issue. The deal can uh, proceed. There are some, the timing situation is a little weird here because experts that I've talked to and that I've been reading like their opinions, experts are divided on whether or not Microsoft can actually close without the CMA completing this new investigation. There's, there's differing opinions. Yes. What I'm, so I, I don't know. I don't honestly know the answer there. What I can tell you is that on the 17th, the day before the deal, Microsoft and the CMA are having a big meeting. They are, they, like It's been publicized. The CMA has confirmed it. They are having a big hearing where they're going to hash some things out. So there's a couple of possibilities. The way I see it, the way I understand the experts, there's two real possibilities. Because either way, this deal is going to happen at this point. Possibility one, the CMA says, okay, look, we need technically some time to complete our investigation. We know this is going to be enough. You can go ahead and close. We'll rescind our order. And while we complete our official investigation of this, because they have to technically do it again since it's a new deal. Microsoft, even a small thing like what Microsoft is removing cloud rights in the UK for ABK, like they still have to investigate it again. Law, legal matters are fascinating. Law is fascinating. I've learned more about legal systems than I ever wanted to for this whole (laughs) deal. So that's possibility number one. Possibility number two is, They say, no, we're not going to let you close just yet, even though we know this is a rubber stamping exercise. However, in that case, it seems like Microsoft and Activision both know the deal is absolutely going to go ahead. So they might be willing to then say, "Okay, let's get a six week extension. Let's just quickly write this out. Let's just write out that, hey, we're extending the deal deadline to the end of August instead of July 18th. Those are the two possibilities, as I understand it. We will find out for sure come uh the 18th yeah we will find out very quickly what the standing is and like you said there are two divisive points on whether or not or or i should say how xbox is going to approach this deal right there there are the the contingent of people who say that they will close the deal over the cma that regardless of how the cma feels how they think they're just going to force this deal through um again there are professionals and analysts who say i don't know if that that's the reality of how it can work um, there are some legal experts who say that, yeah, if they, if they, if they can kind of manhandle this deal through, but again, Microsoft has spent a lot of time and energy trying to, I don't want to say play nice, but really they don't want to, you don't want to rile up these agencies unless you really need to. Yeah. And there is this idea that now that the deal is, it's more or less done that this July 18th date doesn't matter as much because let's right. say they want to see this through with the CMA. They want to do the right thing and they say, all right, if it takes till the end of August, whatever. Again, I'm, Xbox and Activision are actively talking. I imagine they are going to look at that and say, okay, we can wait. We can wait a few more. We've waited 18 months. What's a few more weeks here? We're right. not going to walk away. Um, and that is a realistic possibility as well, that it doesn't close Monday, which is kind of what some people are suggesting. There's been the the mixed, I don't want to say mixed reports, but the wording has been a point of contention regarding Activision Blizzard and NASDAQ. There, initially, it sounded like Activision Blizzard was being removed from NASDAQ on Monday, but then mm-hmm. there was people reaching out with clarification that it's being relisted, or it's still it, entirely it's unclear what that means for this deal. 
But that being said, they are preparing. You know they're preparing for this deal to go through. Uh, I've seen people talk about how they're going back and turning on a bunch of servers for Call of Duties, uh, old Call yeah, of Duty games on Xbox. That's so it been interesting seems see, like yeah. on the back end, they are preparing. Even though the deal isn't official, they are acting as though it's, it's going through. And I think that's where everyone's at. Regardless yeah. of if it's tomorrow, if it's the 18th, if it's August, at this point in time, like you said, with this 99, 99% likely that this deal is closing. What I want to talk about, and you touched on this briefly, is this whole divestiture, divest, God. Divestiture. Divestiture. <laughs> divestiture of the cloud gaming rights for Xbox in the UK. Because that is a realistic possibility, is that for these ABK games, they're going to have to sell the rights for cloud gaming to another company. Does, does that really matter for Xbox's big all-inclusive strategy with Play Anywhere and on console, PC, and cloud if there's a third party in the loop? Um, and do you think that's something that would be reconsidered down the road as Microsoft just looks to get this deal through? Or do you think that that's just Microsoft saying, oh, well, we want this more than we want cloud in the UK, so it is what it is? I think it's somewhere in the middle, Miles. Obviously, they wouldn't want to give it up. That's why they didn't propose it from the very beginning when the CMA brought up cloud concerns. Like, obviously, they would prefer to hold on to the rights to ABK games in the cloud, even if it's just this one specific country that's being affected in the rest of the world, they still have control. Of course, they don't want to give it up. A corporation doesn't want to give up any rights. Any no, IP no, no, no. That being said, I think their experts probably weighed the options and said, look, We'll still have ABK games in the, well, we'll own the rights to ABK games in the cloud everywhere else. This doesn't affect Xbox Game Studios. This doesn't affect ZeniMax slash Bethesda. We still got all that stuff. Just do it. Like if this, if I think it's very much an exhausted, if this is what gets us over the line, this is not a big sacrifice. This does not interfere with our plans that much. I, I agree. Like you said, clearly, if it took 18 months to get to this point, this is a last ditch effort for Microsoft in terms of their consideration, because that does segment their strategy a little bit. But like you said, I think they're, they understand there's more value with the mobile sector here with Call right. of Duty, what those games will mean for recurring revenue every year. And they can just deal with that cloud situation uh, in the yeah. UK specifically and have it be more uh, cohesive everywhere else in the world. I won't even be surprised if like they end up licensing them back for cheap. And so it's just very like it might cost a hair more than they wanted. But like the games are still in X cloud in yes. the UK. I, I would not be shocked at all if that's what happens. Yeah, no, n not even a little bit. So where are you at, Sam, in terms of when this deal is going through? Are you team Monday, Tuesday, or are you team we're going to wait out the, the rest of it through August? You know what, Miles? You, you know what? My head says August, but I'm going to say Monday. My, my head says August. The logic of how long this thing has taken. We are right up to, you realize like we are right up to the wire. Usually when they give a closing date, something happens months before that. Like yes, when Sony it's not Bungie, the they were like, day. Hey, by the end of 2022 is when we'd like to get this done. They got it done a couple months before that. When Microsoft acquired ZeniMax, they acquired Bethesda Softworks and all that. They said, hey, it, it was announced in September 2020. They were like, we'd like to get it done by June 18th, you know, 2021. They got it done in March. It was months ahead of schedule on, on that. Like, this is, uh, we are right up to the wire. It's wild. Every single twist and turn that this thing could have taken, it has <laughs> taken. But I think this is the most dramatic way to end it. So I'm just going for it. Like, Let's, when yeah. am I gonna get, Miles, when am I going to get this opportunity again to bet on something this dramatic for one of the biggest gaming stories in the history of the industry? So no, my head is firmly in August territory, but I'm going to say Monday. Let's I think, do it. Or, or Tuesday or, or Mon Monday, Tuesday. Right? Yeah, like, I'll give you the wiggle could, room of Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, right. The wiggle room of Tuesday should be there, but I I'm just going for it. I'll, I'll go for it and say that. Chips all in. Let's do it. All right. We're all we're all sick of it. OK, it's been fun, but mother of God, okay. we're done. We are yeah, done I, hearing about it. Do you know how boring I don't want to say boring, but you know how annoying it is to hear about trillion dollar companies not being able to spend billions of dollars. 
You know how annoying that is? It, just it, it, it's, for a it's schmuck a on the streets? Like, oh, it's woe, gotten a little woe low, is me. It's so hard for me. Oh, okay. We're done. All right. It's been 18 months of that. We just want to play the games at this point. We just want right. the games in Game Pass. We just want to be on the other side of it. And I swear to God, if you if nothing changes with Activision Blizzard, if we just get a Call of Duty every single year and that's it, oh man, oh, I'm gonna be riding in the streets. I know it's, I know it's a complicated okay? thing. Like it's not gonna happen immediately. They're gonna to have to figure some things out. But immediate. Here's the things I want immediately. Like immediate confirmation. Whenever it happens, I want to know. Uh, I want to make sure that well, so they've explicitly said that like the unionization efforts will be okay 60 days after closing. So that's the legalese on that is like 60 days yes. after the deal happens, you uh, ABK employees can uh, start like continue unionizing without being thrown into a meat grinder by their current overlords, essentially, because that's what's been happening. Um, so 60 days, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that. The other thing. And this, it wouldn't surprise me if this is on a 60 day time or two as well, because they have to transfer stuff, whatever, that's fine. But communicate it, get Bobby Kotick out. That's going to be a big point of contention is how they handle that. Because obviously they don't own the company, so they can't talk about culture. They can't say that. They yet. can't talk about change. They can't talk about personnel. And they have, they have talked about Bobby, the transition of power. That is something that right. they have talked about. So, Bobby will not be gone day one. He no. he won't. That's just they've made that clear. But how long is this dude in the picture? They, is, they need to very quickly make it clear. Is is Microsoft going to touch the last several years of of the workplace complaints of the practices and say, here's our commitment to Activision Blizzard employees. Here's our commitment because they are still technically a separate entity. Um, what does that all look like? Because we have a lot of questions. I had uh, when this first when this acquisition was first announced, that was one of my first big points is, yo, what does this mean for the employees over there? Because this it was announced during a really rough time. Things have changed slightly. But the reason that it was so cheap to buy is because everyone's like, I don't want to work here. This place sucks, dude. Employee this place walkouts. sucks thousands, so bad. Thousands of people walked out. So. What's that all look like? Because you can't just, I shouldn't say you can't, I don't want them to pretend like, oh, things are better now, so we're just gonna, we're gonna ignore that noise. That was in I the understand past. they can't immediately answer every question. I get that. But they need to, there needs to be a plan in place. And there I wonder, I, I have to imagine those conversations have been happening behind the scenes. Because I, Miles, I think those conversations happened back in January last year. I think they had to. Yeah, when you, you approach something like this, you can't. Microsoft has done a lot to be this inclusive workplace, and they've done a lot to build themselves up as a great place to work. And that is completely counter to, to what Activision has been. All right, regardless of whether or not you like their games, that's that's fine. Um, from all everything that we've heard, from the lawsuits, from every everything that's come out about Activision Blizzard over the last decade. It hasn't been an ideal place to work, and they've been making a lot of money off of just really terrible practices for their employees. And that's, again, as much as it's cool to say, all right, well, I get games and Game Pass. That's cool. I get games. Like, for me personally, it can't just, that can't come at the cost of someone else. That's just, to me, it just, that can't be the way we look at it. it that cynically. I need to know that things are better for us mm -hmm. as the consumer because that's you know what microsoft's been banging the drum on and the people who work there because we yep. know it hasn't been great we can't pretend like it has been great and we can't just say oh now that the deal's through they're part of xbox so everything's gucci everything's good man everything's chill bro we get call of duty and game pass son that's it it can't that can't be it not for me mm -hmm. So let's talk about what this deal means for the players then. Actually, I want to get to a quick super chat. Appreciate sure. everyone here. If you're you know, here having a good time, hit the like button, share it out. We have more ABK, ABK stuff to talk about. We're going to have a little more fun with it. A mm -hmm. quick super chat from Nick W says, another game that LRG was announced was the Gex Collection. Hell yeah, the Ge Gex Trilogy. And Plumbers Don't Wear Ties. Another deep, deep ass cut. There's been people coming out on Twitter. Skeptics people who just have questions about the deal and a question I see repeatedly and I want to touch on it with you and I want to touch on it with the chat is 
all right, how does this deal benefit the players? How does this deal benefit the consumers? Because that is, you know, what the Microsoft has been talking about. That's what a lot of the audiences have been talking about is how this deal will benefit us as the average person playing and buying video games. So let's talk about that, Sam. For you, when we look at this AB, proposed ABK deal, when we look at what Microsoft has said, and then when we look at the reality of what this could potentially mean, what exactly does the ABK deal mean for us? So for us specifically, like um, not worker side or anything like that. Yeah, for, for us, me, it, yes. it, come back, it comes back to that word potential, Miles. It comes back to that word potential because I wrote a, 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 like a breakdown of this uh, back in November. I want to say November 2021. God, a long time ago at this point. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, before the deal was announced, a couple months before the deal was announced, breaking down like why Activision just doesn't make games besides Call of Duty. Because yeah. they can't. Because they have just That's the kept machine. on... Call of Duty is the only thing that has kept well in sports games. So Call of Duty and sports games, sports games, it's a little different. Um, some of the changes there are minimal to say the least. <laughs> you know, like Call of Duty has just come out every single year without fail. Doesn't matter the problems, doesn't matter how budgets have gotten higher, doesn't matter that game development takes longer, it comes out every year. But that has come at a cost because the entire publisher, Activision Publishing, is just Call of Duty. It's a Call of Duty publisher. That's what they make. Mm -hmm. So Toys many studios used to make Crash, used to make Spyro, used to make great remasters. Yeah, uh, they're on Call of Duty. High Moon made uh, incredible uh, Transformers oh. games. They're making Call of Duty maps. Raven Software. Uh, you remember Singularity? Singularity. Remember the remember Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein game they made? Wolfenstein 09. You remember that? Oh, well, no, I, oh, Call, I remember. Call of Duty Warzone, buddy. That's all. Just everything uh, has been uh, absorbed. Uh, Sledgehammer originally wanted to do wild spinoffs. That was what they were brought in with the promise of is, hey, you're gonna, it's going to be called Call of Duty, but it's going to be like a third person. And then maybe there's RPG elements, like some wild stuff like that. No, oh, uh, what's that? Vince Zampella, who? Yeah, no, we need you to help out with Modern Warfare 3. And they've just been in the Call of Duty tra train ever since. For me, it's potential. For me, it's like, okay, Call of Duty is important. They need Call of Duty revenue. They're going to make a lot of Call of Duty games. But does a Call of Duty game have to come out every single year? <laughs> does it, though? Does it? I don't think it does. Maybe a Call of Duty game could come out uh, every other year. I think every other year could be cool. And then you get extended support, more maps, more modes, stuff like that in the second year. Or maybe it's on like a 2 2 1 cycle where it's like a Call of Duty game and then a Call of Duty game the next year, but then you skip a year. And yeah. then a Call of Duty game and then a Call of Duty game, but you skip a year. Anything like that, any sort of freeing up some of these resources look i'm under no imp i i'm not i'm under no delusion that like treyarch is suddenly going to stop wanting to make black ops games like th th that's what they're gonna do they want to do that i get it but some of these others they have i know they have dreams and aspirations outside of call of duty activision has a treasure trove of ip phil spencer has explicitly said he wants to go back and look at some of that stuff he name dropped hexen wore a hexen t-shirt uh, yo, Phil, you know, at Phil, the recent showcase, Phil, Phil so. I see Phil Spencer in the chat here. Um, or someone, I should say someone named Phil Spencer. I, <laughs> I don't have full you know, confidence that is Phil Spencer, but I will say, Phil, before you do Hexen, I'm sorry, you owe me Phantom Dust. You really do. You can wear your hex. You can wear your hex and T-shirt. That's cool. Good on you. But if we're going back to obscure IP that deserve a reboot. You owe me Phantom Dust. I'm sorry. You revealed the trailer. You promised it. Where's it at? It's been a little. It's been a little while. I know things were different. Different time for Xbox. Things were a little different. You've got new resources. You've got new studios. You've invested in gaming in a way you've never seen before. And you're gonna tell me you're gonna do Hexen before you do Phantom Dust? My God, man. Am I wrong, Sam? Am I out of line? <laughs> I don't think you want to hear my opinion on that, Miles. <laughs> no, we're going to get into it right no, now. Hit me. Even though I want Hexen more, I will grant you your flowers and say, I know you've been riding the Phantom <laughs> Dust train all these years. I get it. I want you to be happy. I want you to get Okay, okay, Dust. thank you. Thank I you. do genuinely. But um, so, and then outside of that as well, there is, uh, you know, Blizzard. There's all of Blizzard to work on. Now, Blizzard, I think, is in a better place. Not incredible, I'm not going to say stellar, but better place than Activision Publishing. But uh, Blizzard, you have another franchise that you haven't been touching for a while. It's called StarCraft. 
You know, you, you remember the uh, revolutionary RTS, the only RTS on par with Age of Empires in terms of cultural significance and sales and all that? Um, what are we doing? Where you at? Was Starcraft... What are, we, what are we doing here? What year was that? Was that 2010? Or was it... Uh, Wings of Liberty was 2010. Yes, I, I swear it was 2010. It better not be a different year, but I'm going to find out one second. I'm, che I'm checking your StarCraft cred. I'm a StarCraft yep. casual, so I don't have to know that Wings information. All right. of Liberty Fact was... checking. On 2010. Go. Yep, there okay. we go. Nailed we it. it. Just kidding. I'm a hardcore StarCraft fan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like, um, come, come on. What are we doing? Diablo 4? Incredible. Love it. Mm -hmm. Fantastic stuff. World of Warcraft. I'm not a player. My understanding is that it's it hasn't been this good in a long time. People are loving Dragonflight. They're loving the updates. Cool. That's great. Good stuff. Where's Starcraft? Bring it back. Thanks. And then and lastly, I, I just want to touch on this really quickly, Miles. I don't think it's as important to us, but I think we would be naive and foolish not to mention it. And that's King and the mobile gaming aspect. And the fact that Microsoft and Phil Spencer has explicitly said, hey, we want to build a mobile Xbox store. We want to build, yes. you know, a mobile game pass that can like fi finally bring something into mobile gaming that can compete with Google and Apple. That's a pipe dream up until now. The only mobile team they have uh, right right now at this moment is Alpha Dog the team at Bethesda that did uh, like the, the mini Doom game, which is cool. That's neat. That's not going to compete with Google and Apple. No. But the makers of Candy Crush and then Blizzard making Diablo Immortal and you got Call of Duty Mobile, Call of Duty Warzone is coming to mobile. That might do it. That just might do something. That You know, that might move the needle. And that's, again, Xbox talks about being everywhere and they want to be everywhere, but somewhere they have not been in any meaningful capacity is mobile. And again, I know we in the console space, we, we meme the, y'all have a phone, right? But you know. that a lot of people do. And a lot of people mostly engage with games on their phone. A lot of people aren't going to buy a console. A lot of people aren't going to buy a gaming PC. And if you just, ex you know, for these businesses, I think they've just accepted that to certain capacity. And they're not making games that replace the console and PC games because those still exist and people still want those. They're just creating games for the people who just want to play something on their phone casually. And there's a huge audience for that. As we've seen with Diablo Immortals, which got clowned, it got clowned by us. It got clowned by the, the core gaming community. The amount of money that that game is gener generating mm -hmm. is ridiculous. Comical. It's, it's ongoing. No one talks about it on Twitter because I know it's not in for the Twitter crowd. Uh, that game is doing well, y'all. That game is doing it's, really well. It's doing, we all thought it would, you know, have the big rollout initially and then fizzle off. No, it's, it's bringing in money. It's bringing in lots and lots of money. And um, theoretically, when I, when I look at this deal, when I look at Diablo Immortal, when I look at all that money from Call of Duty, I, again, much like you, I think about the possibilities for what that means for games. First and foremost, I'm excited because this means a lot of big games that I would buy are going to be in Game Pass. And so that sure. saves me money. So as a player, as a consumer, as much as I, that word gets under my skin a it, bit. It, I, it's gotten a little low, gotten a little stale. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, like you, I don't like the idea that we are just designed to buy things. That is our purpose on this planet. Um, but that being said, we get to save money and that's huge. That's from. For me, I love Game Pass. I love saving money. As much as I would love to buy every game at $60, $70, I just don't make enough money to do that. You know? I wish I did. All right? If, if I did, it wouldn't be a problem. But Game Pass lets me play more games, and it'll have bigger games. So that's cool. That's a win for the average person. They're saving money. But when we look at the potential for these, these licensed franchises, all of these franchises that Xbox now essentially owns, and even though Activision has a set number of studios and those studios are going to be on set projects, there's potential for Xbox to lean into its publishing division, take those IP that it owns, and have someone else make it. We, we got the, devast the devastating news that there was going to be a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 and 4 from the GOAT's Vicarious Visions, who created Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, the, just the, a 10 out of 10 absolute perfect remake of two of the best games of all time they absolutely nailed that experience and then immediately immediately after that they were dissolved and i was like no 
And then I moved and, into Blizzard. But yes. Y- yes. Yeah, moved into Blizzard. And then we learned that Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 and 4 was going to be a thing, but because of those moves to focus on the money makers, focus on Call of Duty, focus on Diablo, focus on Overwatch, the Vicarious Visions just they weren't part of that plan. And it reminds me of kind of what happened with Visceral, where they were out there doing great work, putting out great games. And then because of the the publisher machine that they were in, that didn't matter. It wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. Uh, and so that hurt. That one hurt. And so I look at Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. I look at Crash Bandicoot. I look at Prototype. I look at these these IPs that have been, that are, that have potential to Remember do Radical? something. Remember Radical? Remember Radical? Oh, yeah. Seen? Yeah, I do. And so there's a huge potential for games, more, of more a, a wider variety of games. I'm not going to sit here and clown on Call of Duty because I know Call of Duty, Call of Duty is a big deal to a lot of people. I like sure. Call of Duty. It's fun. It's, it's just not my favorite game. It's not going to be my favorite game. And when they release one every year, it's just it's not necessarily for me. And that's fine. It's for a lot of people. So when I look at what this deal could do for me, it could bring me the games that I want. And it could bring those games day one to Xbox Game Pass. And so for me, as a current subscriber of Xbox Game Pass, that is a net win. You could argue that, oh, I don't have an Xbox. I don't have a game. I don't have Game Pass. So how is that a win for me? Um, and then you could you could use the value proposition. Well, technically, it would be cheaper for you to play your games here. And so that is theoretically a win for you, even though you have to invest in a console, uh, invest in or invest in Xbox Game Pass, the subscription, which you can play anywhere. You can play on your phone. You can play on your PC. You don't technically have to buy an Xbox. And so that is another way that the average person who has an interest in video games can benefit from this deal. So there are wins. I'm not going to sit here and say there's no concerns and that Microsoft has no ulterior motives. I don't I don't know. I don't know what the business is. I don't know what their long term strategy is. Ultimately, well, they want to make money. Ultimately, they want to make more money than they've ever made constantly over and over again, forever until the end of time, like every other business. So you could say that's an ulterior motive. But as long as people aren't being exploited fundamentally, as long as we're getting some good deals. I, yeah, the, the, the entire case of this thing that would harm the consumer right now. I'm not sure how exactly. And so I guess I'll when, ask you and I'll ask the chat. Yeah. yeah. How could this deal hurt the consumer i'll be completely honest miles i don't see it i just i don't see it i i think there were questions i think this deal deserved investigation it deserved scrutiny like people all the people saying it should have been rubber stamped or whatever like no no it needed to be investigated but i think some regulators did a much better job i think of Cade in uh brazil which basically looked and said okay but microsoft doesn't have the presence in mobile the commitment to keep Call of Duty multi-platform for the next 10 years is like, that's that's ironclad. This is, they would suffer so badly if they break it. The financials don't make sense to pull Call of Duty. Call of Duty should be like Minecraft. They've made that comparison over and over. Mine, like, no, it's everywhere. New games come out everywhere. And then I look at everything else and I just go, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing it. I'm just not seeing it. I, this is a... This is going to be a controversial thing. This might be the thing that gets me canceled, Miles. So no, say I'm not here. Don't do but it. You are not entitled to a game on your platform. You're just, you're, you're not. Just because it's been there before. I say it about Bethesda. I'll say it about the Square Enix deals that Sony does. Like, uh, you're, you're not entitled to Starfield on your PS5 just because Bethesda used to be third party. I'm not entitled to Final Fantasy 16 on my Xbox just because Final Fantasy 15 was on Xbox. It's like... Yeah, it sucks. I can think it sucks. I, th- yeah. I think you can think it sucks in certain situations, but it's the name of the game. And I don't see a monopoly. And if cloud, and I have my questions about cloud gaming. I, I have my, I have questions. I don't know if it's actually going to take off. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. We'll see how this thing goes. But if it does take off, I think the way the European Commission handled it was very good in saying, okay, we'll let you do this. But anyone who buys an Xbox game, an ABK game, you know, whatever, they, for the next 10 years, get the right to stream it on their service of choice, on their white label. As long as they bought the game, they can use Boosteroid. They can use Ubitus. They can use uh, NVIDIA Gef- GeForce Now. I think that's, dare I say it, pro-consumer. Dare? How dare you say it? How? D- that's where I'm at. Is I do I agree that I think cloud has is the most 
realistic concern when we look at competition, not how it benefits right. the consumer right. per se, but realistically, there are next to no players who can compete with Xbox once the ABK deal goes through on the cloud front. They're going to have a, a ridiculous arsenal of huge games. They're going to have the infrastructure to execute it in a way that only a Google, only an Amazon, only an Apple could do. And we've seen Google try and, and fail to do that. And we don't know that the other players are going to. Um, and we don't know where the cloud market's going to go. But as soon as Microsoft demonstrates that there is money to be made and they can be successful there, those other big players can do it and no one else can do it. And that's just going to be where it's at. So I don't think that's unfair to say. I think that's just the reality of where cloud's at is the average smaller company can't can't match. Mm -hmm. When I look at the consumer, I, again, I don't see how it's a negative impact. Re ultimately, especially when we're talking about Activision, who um, is not a very pro-consumer company inherently. They haven't had a lot of practices or monetization models designed to benefit us from the get-go. So I think there's even a, a chance for Activision as a whole to have a better monetization system, a system that benefits us. And I think that is a net win. So the, the argument that it is going to hurt consumers has not been demonstrated in any meaningful way at any point during these, these conversations because yeah. it's hard to pinpoint what the damage is. Competition on the cloud front, that is the most realistic one. Everywhere else, Microsoft is not dominating. I, Microsoft is not even winning. So you can't say that they, you know, that's going to hurt competition for the other players who are the dominant players, your PlayStations of the world. The idea that this deal would make it so they can't compete is asinine because PlayStation is a huge global brand, a huge worldwide brand in a way that Xbox is not. And just losing Call of Duty, despite the fact that, you know, even if Call of Duty was exclusive, which I think we all know is not the right business call. No, no. That would, that would hurt PlayStation. Yes, definitely. They would lose money every single year, but then Xbox also inherently would lose money every single year on what they could have potentially sold. You could offset that with Game Pass at a certain point, blah, blah, blah. The reality is that's not happening and it doesn't really make sense. Um, but yeah, so the, the argument that it's going to hurt us, the average player, has not been demonstrated. And Xbox, despite their monopoly concerns with Windows, because I think that's where a lot of this stems from, is the early Microsoft, the hyper-aggressive mm -hmm. Microsoft, who was actively trying to just dominate and destroy every other partner and make sure that no one else could exist. And again, I've yeah, been watching yeah. Succession, and there's a lot of funny parallels to that idea and early Microsoft, where they just wanted to be the only thing. And you mm -hmm. know those executives had the conversations where they were talking about absolutely destroying their competition making and doing everything in their power to execute that. I don't think that that's currently where Microsoft is, despite the fact that they are bigger than they've ever been. They're making more money than they've ever made. Um, but so far, they haven't been doing a lot that damages us. So with this deal, for me, as just a schmuck with Xbox Game Pass, <laughs> it seems like a win. It seems just like a net positive. Yeah. Because I don't have to, nobody has to buy anything else that they don't already have for the most part. There will be exclusive games, absolutely. Sure. But that's, again, as we've seen with Nintendo and PlayStation, that is the nature of the industry. That it, Whether you like it or not, and I'll say I don't, um, exclusives inherently benefit the platform holder and don't inherently benefit us. Um, that's... But that's that's the business, baby. So I, I don't know. I, it's It's been tough to pinpoint because I thought about that when I wrote this question is, am I going to be able to come up with something that's negative for me? And so far, I can't. I don't know. Yeah. Theoretically, they could jack up the prices. Sure. But if nobody Price, else... Uh, Xbox and PlayStation have both raised prices without it. So inflation is a thing. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah, it's been tough. But now... We're going to have some fun. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about the games we want to see come to Game Pass on the other side of this. We're going to be talking about the games that could exist, our dream games, all of that. Real quick, I want to give a huge shout out to the 216 amazing people joining us live. If you are digging Ooh. the show, smash that like button, share it out, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. Super chat from the dude, the podcast producer himself, Yodani Quazada, who says, Miles got... Miles Hare got the you'll be hearing from my family attorney in the front and the resisting arrest in the back. Show us the <laughs> angle of the hair. 
So I've been working on my mullet, y'all. All right, y'all, y'all. If you're watching the the video version, you get an exclusive look at my my luxurious. Try to get you a good angle. Oh yeah, yeah that's that's a good summary. Oh. That's a good summary. Oh yeah, that's so exactly yeah, exactly what's going on there. I've been dialing it in. You know, I've been really work putting in the work, really uh, fine tuning my my hair over the years, and this is what I've settled on: a fusion of a mullet and a mohawk. Um, and you know, it looks good. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, it looks good. <laughs> It's good, man. It's good. <laughs> okay. So let's start, Sam. Let's say this deal goes through Monday or Tuesday. And let's say there's this fantasy scenario where they've already concocted a massive batch of Xbox Game Pass drops. Again, for the record, I will say that I don't know that that's going to happen. Seems a little optimistic. But that but being it said, happened with Bethesda. It, that's it true. It did happen with Bethesda. So it's not unprecedented. So let's say... Boom, Tuesday, they say, all right, deals closed, baby. Activision, welcome to the family. And here you go. Here's a fat list of Xbox Game Pass games from Activision that are coming. Hit me with some standouts. What do you want to see first and foremost from this portfolio? I think so. I, I want to see all the older Diablo games. So uh, the Diablo 3 and then Diablo 2 Resurrected. Both of those got to be on there. Mm, Just yeah. immediately. Both, get mm. both of those on that list. Um, I don't think we see Diablo 4 yet, but we can talk a little bit more about that in a minute if you disagree or something. But I think those older ones, get them in there. Maybe that encourages people to then buy Diablo 4, something like that. Um, we need Crash and Spyro, all of them. Any game with Crash yep. or Spyro, just get them in there. The, the, the Reignited Trilogy and the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy, great remaster or great remakes, really. Uh, great, great work that was done there. So get them in there. Uh, we need on the... No, StarCraft 2 has actually been free to play, right? Wings of Liberty has been free to play. So that wouldn't work on PC gaming. Uh, n no, that, that wouldn't work at all. But we need the older Call of Duties. So I say older because we know there's been some shenanigans uh, with the PlayStation deal about like the recent ones that PlayStation has been partnered with and promoting and marketing and getting exclusive content. Seems like there might be some contracts keeping those from being in Game Pass immediately. We don't really know. But like anything older in my mind than like, say, what was it? Modern Warfare 2019. I have a hard time thinking any Call of Duty game older than that can't come to Game Pass. So just imagine being able to like, if you want to play the campaigns, just there you go. Every you Call of Duty campaign. Game, all these older Call of Duty games. That's fantastic. That's great. We need to see those. And then you brought it up. Uh, Tony Hawk, the, the one plus two remake, like get that thing in there, get it in there ASAP. It's hot. It's, it's hot. 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 It's yeah. The potential is massive for that list, that big infographic. We've seen mock-ups of people making mm -hmm. it. And it, like you said, I think that the, I agree the older call of duties, because we don't know what the marketing restrictions are. The, right, the current right. call of duty PlayStation deal is active until 2024, right? That's what the, Through the end of 2024. Yes. So that's what the legal documents Call of Duty, have said. Yes. The legal doc, according to the legal documents, the earliest we can expect a new Call of Duty game is 2025 in Game Pass. Yes. So, so again, we don't know. Maybe there is a it's a one year thing or a two year thing. We don't know. So I'm just going to err on the side of caution. Here. But yeah, that being said, I can't imagine the the older I'll say older Call of Duties sell a lot of copies just year over year at this point so it, it makes total sense to just just load those in let people go back and if they are turning on the servers for some of these older call of duties imagine just the the boost of game pass you and the squad are like let's go play modern warfare 2 bro let's go play the og modern warfare 2 let's play some of these older games let's play black ops 2 let's play black ops 3 and they have the servers on it's in game pass so these games that you know maybe didn't have a huge community now can just have that instantly millions of people have game pass can go in and play all of these games i think crash team rumble is a prime example of a more recent release mm -hmm. that could be mm -hmm. They could use a boost from Game Pass because it's a multiplayer focused thing. A lot of people weren't sure on it. It's got a seasonal content strategy with the battle pass, etc. Drop that in a Game Pass. Get people checking that out. I think that's a huge one. I want to see all of the Crash games. I want to see all the Spyros. Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 guaranteed. There's, there's just, there's so much potential. And they've re-released the prototypes as well, correct? On Xbox One. Yeah, they are particularly remasters. good, but yes. I mean, hey, they, they, throw, drop those in there. Yeah, no, for, for Game Pass, it's fine. It's just, it wasn't worth the price. It wasn't worth the full price because it was just, 
oh, we bumped it up to 1080p. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but, but for Game Pass, sure. We got Gun. There's some, there's some cuts. That list mm. could be astronomical. If they have been working on it behind the scenes, I'm excited to see that infographic. Yeah. And I think that's going to be a, a potential moment for Game Pass because we know Game Pass has been growing, but we also know Game Pass has not been growing at the rate at which they hope. Because right. there have been really lofty expectations. And again, these are just bonuses. So it's not that their Game Pass isn't profitable. It's funny that they have to come out and say Game Pass is profitable profitable over and over and over again. I think that's a weird messaging beat that they keep touching on. But they are making sure people know that Game Pass is profitable. So I, talk, I totally lost my train of thought. Um, big moment for Game Pass. Oh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> so, yes, that could be a big moment and a big boost to Xbox Game Pass subscribers. When you see the Call of Duty logo next to the Xbox Game Pass logo and you've set the precedent. Yo, you love Call of Duty? You might want to reconsider where you're playing, bro, because this yeah. is this is what you can expect from us. And we, we're going to have the community. The Xbox Game Pass community is going to be the one over here just going back to the classics, really you know, li living, loving Call of Duty. And so it's going to feel like the 360 heydays where, you know, Xbox, it's the shooter box, bro. You want to you want to party? You want to have a good time? Come over to Xbox. All right. That's where it's going down. And so I'm curious to see if there will be some sort of instantaneous boost. Do you think that's possible? You think that's I, I realistic? I think there will be some. It, like Bethesda, it's not going to be everything. There were a few Bethesda games that were tied up in, well, it was PS Now at the time. Now it would be called PlayStation Plus Extra. But there were a couple of those that they couldn't bring immediately. But they had, I think, 20 games. I want to say it was 20 Bethesda games instantly. Something similar here is very reasonable. It won't be everything, but it'll be a nice chunk. And then the remainder, you know, the, the, state, the others that aren't in yet can sort of filter in over the next few months. Yeah. All right, Sam. For our last major topic of the show here, we're going to have some fun. We t you right. and I both, when we talked about the benefits to consumers with this deal, we both talked about the possibilities for IP, the possibilities right. within Xbox. So we are going to pitch those possibilities. We're going to pitch our dream Activision Blizzard games. And I want to hear it. Give me, give me three games you want to see you and I in this hypothetical scenario, you okay. and I are directly in charge of green lighting and funding All right. Xbox games and Activision games after this act acquisition is closed. Nothing is off limits. We can do what we want. We have unlimited budget. What are you whipping up? So immediately, the first thing is Toys for Bob. Your patience has been rewarded. You've got Crash and Spyro to play around with. So you're going to do a crossover. But what's this? You're part of Xbox. Pull in Banjo. Let's get a three-way crossover going. Crash, crossover. Spyro, and Banjo in the same game. It's the bear and bird's time. They're back with the dragon. Like, let's do it. <clears throat> let's, let's do this thing. So immediately, that's, that's the first one. Top of the list. Gotta happen, dude. Gotta happen. Three's Company. Crash Bandicoot, Spyro, Banjo-Kazooie, Toys for Bob coming to the table and just really doing this just other level 3D platformer, a 3D yep. platformer that competes with your Mario Odysseys of the world. Gets people talking about the pot, the genre again, a genre that some people say only Mario can do. Nah, it's time. It's time for a new Titan to enter the arena. And I think Toys for Bob is primed. Like on my list, I had just them doing a, a Toys for Bob, just a reboot or a remake of Banjo, but hell yeah, let's let's amp that up. Let's do the, the, the threes company, Banjo, Spyro, yep. Crash Bandicoot coming together, baby. Let's go. I'm in. <laughs> what right, else so you got? Number two. Number two. Blizzard is going to do a third person StarCraft shooter with the aid of the coalition. Mm, StarCraft Ghost, anyone? Remember that little? Yeah. It doesn't that... have to be Ghost. They could do Ghost if they wanted, but it doesn't have to be. Imagine even being like a bulky Terran Marine, you know, just fighting Zerg, but in third person, not at a bird's eye view. Get, get the coalition to give you some tips on how cover and third person combat should feel. Mm -hmm. If they're, yeah, I want the third person Starcraft game where you're just fighting the Zerg. You're, you're experiencing the Zerg rush from the ground exactly. level. Oh man. Coalition knows that they know, they, they know their way around third person shooters. They oh, know yeah. their way around swarms of enemies. That would be amazing. I would love to see that. And I would also love to see 
the Halo do that exact same thing as well. A third person. <laughs> yeah, game I would too. Yep. Focused on the flood. Let's oof. Mm. But yeah, love that. StarCraft third person shooter from the coalition. One of again, we talked about Obsidian earlier being a standout. The coalition, I'm really excited to see what they do with Unreal Engine 5. Oh, They've yeah. always it, been just the showcase for what this tech can do. Yeah, and obviously it was pre-COVID times, games take longer now, but they made Gears 4 in under two years. They made Gears 5 in under three years. So even with COVID, COVID's de definitely a thing. You got to keep that in mind. And we know they've been acting as a support team for some of the others, but uh, what, what, what are they cooking up? What are they what cooking are they up with Gears 6? Up? Let's see. But my last one, my last one. I know I mentioned StarCraft 3, and I do want StarCraft 3 as an asterisk mark. Put that to the side. But there's another RTS series that has just languished and languished. And I want a proper Warcraft 4. Oh, Warcraft 3. Now that was a moment, man. That was a mm. moment where everyone you knew who played on PC was playing that game, organizing LAN parties, playing on Battle.net. Oh, man, that was a great, that was a peak moment for online multiplayer. Starcraft 4. I remember playing Starcraft 3, or not Starcraft 4, Warcraft 3. I know what you meant. Yeah, I know what you um, meant. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z mods all damn day. All <laughs> day. Being Trunks, Goku, <laughs> playing Warcraft 3. Oh, man, that takes me back. I would love to see that. And a lot of people have been calling for that because they did the Warcraft, was it the, it was Warcraft 1 remake, right? No, Whatever. it was 3. It oh, was 3, but. Was it 3? That was yeah, the only but they kind of botched a lot of elements of it. Yep. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. I remember nothing but negativity surrounding that least, uh, release. No, no one was excited. No one was happy. And it was such a disappointing moment because people felt like, hey, maybe they finally are going back to that well and revisiting this franchise that people love. And then they did, but they didn't show a lot of time or mm -hmm. care. And so that killed the hope of something else. But. I think this deal blows that door wide open. Maybe who would you get to make it? Uh, Blizzard has multiple teams at this point. They have multiple studios. So like I know Diablo four expansions and Overwatch two and like World of Warcraft needs support in Hearthstone, but like they've expanded quite a bit. Activision Blizzard, Miles, uh, for content. Now this is all of Activision Blizzard King, not just Blizzard, but they've grown in the time this deal was announced from over 10,000 employees to almost 17,000. Oh yeah, that's a, that's growth. Those are big numbers. That's, gro that's growth. Sure, there's some contractors in there, but come on. So they they can find one. They can peel a Blizzard studio off or two to work on StarCraft and Warcraft. They can do it. Let's let's do it. All right. Uh, this is not on my list, but I want to shout this out because it needs to happen. It no matter what the timeline is, no matter what the the world looks like. Rainbolt says one versus 100. That needs to come, or no, sorry. Captain Hank says, when is one versus 100 going to come back? <laughs> That's what I want to know. There was this good question. weird good talk question. that they were doing a HoloLens version of it. And I was like, what? I'm sorry. Xbox is play anywhere now. You have Xbox on your phone. You have Xbox on your PC and your console. And you're going to do it for HoloLens? What? You're going you're gonna to make this big social community game on the most niche thing you can possibly imagine? What's wrong with you? And so one versus 100 right now with an Xbox app, come on. That would be such a huge, huge weekly thing. Imagine if there was just a weekly Xbox game show where anyone who had an Xbox account could participate. Sounds like the kind of thing that would fit perfectly on an Xbox mobile store. Mm -hmm. You know, just, just saying. Just, just putting it out there. Just putting it out there. All right, here's my list. You covered one of mine. I, I agree. I'm with you. Toys for Bob needs to make a dope ass 3D platformer that includes Banjo. That that has to happen. Crash Bandicoot 4. So many people slept on that game. It was so, so good. So, so good. And I want that moment for, for Banjo in some capacity. So that's that's my first one. Another thing, I'm all, I'm all about the crossovers. We've seen what they can do for brands. We've seen what they can do for engagement. Um... I want to see, and I've talked about this before, Crash Bandicoot's Pro Skater. And I want this to be <laughs> a mascot 
party skateboarding game for Xbox that brings in Xbox mascots, brings in Crash Bandicoot, brings in Banjo-Kazooie. It's a mix of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Mario Party, and it's just a, a casual, fun, ongoing skateboarding game. Add a, add a Fall Guys-inspired Battle Royale grind mode where it's 20 people skating down, down this just never-ending hill trying to survive. There's so much potential for that. I want to see that so bad. That's one. That's one that's been, I've been sitting on that idea for a long time. It's an idea that keeps popping back into my head and I, I just want it. I want it to They exist. have the characters for a crossover. They've, they've got them at this point. Like, come on. And again, this is another one that's been floating around the community for a long time. It's, we've had conversations about this before, but with the closure of the Activision Blizzard deal and the mascots, Xbox, you need a platform fighter. You, 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 you need one at this point. You need a platform fighter. You're going to have Master Chief. You're going to have Crash Bandicoot. You're going to have Spyro. You're going to have Ori. You can throw o Ori, Ori in there. Uh, some Diablo characters like Tyrio or Lilith or Anyone something like that. Anyone from Overwatch, Tracer, Literally, Reinhardt. Tracer is perfect. Tracer, Tracer and Reinhardt are perfect. Um, the, the, yeah, trying to, there are just gotta be some other Bethesda characters that you could throw in there, like the Dova King. Yeah, Dova King, absolutely. Some... Yeah, Pip Boy. Let's yeah, Pip Boy, Pip Boy, per perfect. Well, well, you mean the Fallout Boy, but like he's oh he's yes, always yes, the icon. Pip, yeah, yes. Um, so there's there's so much potential for that, and especially as we look at the other side of this deal. Again, it doesn't need to even be made by Activision. They just need to use those rights, and they need to yep. go to Bandai. They need to go to Bandai and say, all right. We know you guys aren't supporting ongoing content for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Um, here's whatever amount of money you need or want. Mm -hmm. We want you. You have proven that you are the best in the business when it comes to making a platform fighter. And we want you. They need to pick up that. If I'm if I'm in charge, if this is the situation, I'm calling Bando, Bandai Namco the day this deal closes and saying, here's this list of IP. Here's here's an amount of money. Do you want in? We, we want you to make us a platform fighter. How do we make this happen? And I, I'm sorry, I can't, I cannot imagine that not being a hit if, if they do it right. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. So again, let crop. Moral of the story: crossovers, baby. It's what the yep. gamers crave. But and open the floodgates. And that's what that's that's the most exciting thing about this deal is that you know it feels like much like Bethesda, anything's possible now. All right, if this once this deal goes through, anything's on the table. The sky's the limit. We can get things that were never possible before. Um, and, you know, that's the hope. That's why a lot of us talk about the video games industry and talk about these ideas is because we get excited. Because we've all had a game or a moment that's been something we've never expected and given us that that just feeling that is unmatched. And uh, there's there's huge potential here. So I'm excited. We got some great lists of games. Um, but, yeah, I think this deal is almost done. How are we going to celebrate on the other side? That's what I want to know. Am I, drink... I have some whiskey I'm breaking into. <laughs> uh, am I drinking six, four locos on stream? Is that how you got we... it? You got it, man. Oh, just get a, a, a 24 pack of hard Mountain Dew and just one, one Dew per minute for 24 minutes. I mean, when, when are you going to have another opportunity to do something like this? Actually, sorry, I'll, I'll get 69 Hard Mountain Dews. There you go. For every That's billion, it. and I'll do one Hard Mountain <laughs> Dew per minute for 69 minutes. <laughs> and then I will be dead, and I will have... <laughs> <laughs> all right, Sam, let's get on out of here. Huge shout out to all the people who joined us. Appreciate you all for tuning in to Xbox Chatter Days. If you had a good time, hit the like button. Leave a comment. If you're listening to the audio versions, again, leave a review. Sam. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you coming again. Back to back episodes of Xbox Chatter Days for the amazing people joining us. Where can they get a hold of you? Yeah, as always, thank you for inviting me, Miles. Even if it was last minute, lots of last minute stuff happening for me recently. Yeah, buddy, <laughs> but, uh, let's go. Yeah, you, you, you had to, you had to do it to me. Uh, thank you. It's always great talking to you, bro. And yeah, if anyone doesn't know, you can find me on Twitter at Samuel Talbert. I'm also at Samuel Talbert on Blue Sky, since who knows what happens with Twitter. And while I'm not on there as much, I am on threads at Sam Talbert 484. So you can find me all three of those places. And hopefully one of them survives. Hopefully one of them makes it out. So yeah, we'll see. yes. So yeah, show Sam some love. Appreciate all of you. We're going to get on out of here. Have an amazing week. Have an amazing weekend. And we'll be back next week to 
probably talk more about ABK. But in the meantime, have a good one, everybody. <laughs> Take care, everybody.